First of all, thank you very much, Paul, for that uh, introduction. And um, thanks to Kevin for inviting me back here and for um, being the one person, I suppose, who has spotted um, maybe what I have done, aside for the moment from um, Frank McNally and the Irish Times. So um, just going to give you a quick introduction to how this book came about. I was doing a book in Percy French after I left the Oriel because I realised there was a need for a good book. Anyway, that book was kind of taken by somebody else. I was always going to do more on the Jarby because I found it absolutely fascinating from the first time I saw it. And um, I said to myself then, this did not escape James Joyce. And I didn't. So I then decided I, I was going to do more on the Jarby anyway. But then I knew there was a bit about uh, quite an, a lot of the, um, of the uh, songs of Percy French were in Finnegan's Wake. So I thought I am try to flesh that out a bit. And then it just, I, something happened that I never expected to happen. I started reading about Finnegan's Wake because I couldn't read it. So I bought a good guide and I got compelling clues that Percy French was mm, very dominant in Finnegan's Wake. And one clue led to the next. So in the middle of the pandemic, with very little resources, I just had a good guide, mind you, anything I could get online, I was determined. And something beyond me, I just had to know, even though the book, Finnegan's Wake, nearly killed me. It's a very difficult book. So to simplify it down, sorry. Huh? It's not good. My hands, oh yeah. Oh, I shouldn't have my hands on it. Okay. So I'm going to try and simplify down what is co considered to be history of the world in 628 pages of Finnegan's Wake. And I kept tracing Percy French in it. And he's very dominant in it. So um, I suppose the average Joycean uh, who wouldn't know much about Percy French would miss a lot of the clues that I got. The first thing that kind of made me think was even the famous ballad in it, the ballad of Percy O'Reilly. And I even think of Percy O'Reilly, you know. Um, but then, very early on in Finnegan's Wake, there was this reference to Jehu. And Jehu was a Victorian slang word for a cab driver, was one of French's pseudonyms in Finnegan's Wake. So that made me curious, and so it just took off, right? So um, the, I, I put this in question format because the Joyceans haven't yet uh, come to terms with what I have found. They haven't, most of them haven't got the book except at the symposium. So, um, but they did read about it in the Irish Times. So I put it as a question. Is uh, Percy French the hero of the most extravagant wake in human history? Is he? I believe he is, and I believe I'll be vindicated in that. Huh? Back a bit from it, Okay. Okay, so um, that's my book there, and um, so here's the first sentence. So just going to say a bit about uh, Finnegan's Wake, because it's such a complicated book. So it's a circular book, and it's a cycle of life going over and over and over again, and um, it begins at the end, and uh, the end goes back to the beginning. So it's really, there's no end to Finnegan's Wake. You can just say the last page on the first page, but there's no end, because it ends on the and it starts on um, River Run. So I start here at the end. Um, away, alone, a last, a loved, along the River Run, past Eve and Adams. So River Run is the beginning. Um, and you can read it there. And then it goes back to Hoth Castle and environs. And uh, Joyce came to believe that all of this human endeavor was crystallized in Christian minstrelry, which was songs, in mainly the ballad. Songs, opera, vaudeville, every kind of music, that he believed that music expressed the human thing, that no matter what happened, people got up, worked, fell in love, wrote songs about it, celebrated in song, all types of songs. So that's kind of how Finnegan's Wake is structured. Now, it is believed by all the Joycians that there's a central hero, Finnegan. And for years, they've been wondering who Finnegan is. So, um, Finnegan, the, the hero of Finnegan's Wake leaves Dublin. Uh, you know, he was an important man who leaves Dublin. That's in it. So F French, was, French left Dublin when Joyce was 18 and relocated in England. Of course, he was always over and back, but he left Dublin at that time. So HCE, I have it there bolded because HCE is the hero of the wake. Here comes every man, our Humphrey Chimpton earwicker. So it's also Holt Castle and Barnes because every person in Finnegan's Wake also has 
they're represented by um, a building or, you know, a tree or a, a cloud or whatever. So, um, so Percy French is the model for Finnegan's Wake. Okay, so Finnegan's Wake is it's cosmic. That's why it's called Finnegan's. And there's no, there's no pos to be S in the title. And if people make that mistake, it's Finnegan's Wake. And it isn't even Finnegan's S apostrophe, mind you. So um, it's based, of course, um, but it's uh, an expression from the singular model Finnegan. So there's Finnegan, and then it becomes everybody's life. And Joyce brings all these people in from history and myth and the Bible and all the rest of it, kind of parallels to Finnegan. So um, I'm saying two of French's songs are thematic in Finnegan's Wake. Um, the ballad has primacy in Finnegan's Wake, and there is a ballad in Finnegan's Wake called The Ballad of Percy Wiley, and it's in, it's in Chapter 2. So the, there's the ballad Finnegan's Wake itself, which everybody knows, about the drunken builder who gets up on a ladder and falls down, and um, he's, uh, whiskey is poured over him at his wake, and he wakes, comes back to life again. And that's, that's, the, that's where he gets his title, but as I said, Finnegan's becomes Finnegan's, all the Finnegan's. Then there's Phil de Fluter's Ball, which is very, very um, thematic. He becomes Phil Finnegan very quickly. And Phil de Fluter's Ball is grafted on to uh, the ballad Finnegan's Wake very early on. But also I've detected The Fortunes of Finnegan, which is a song by Percy French, which is also about an indestructible giant. And that's very much thematic in Finnegan's Wake as well. And then, of course, French had um, My Friend Finnegan, which was one of his sketch sketches. That sort of seems to come into it thematically as well. So, um, okay. So Finnegan's Wake, the structure of it. So, as I said, from the singular Finnegan to the cosmic Finnegan's, that's how it's structured. Um, I uh, personally, I think seventy to eighty percent of Finnegan is about the central character, and then twenty to thirty percent or thereabouts, in my opinion, is all the Finnegan's. But I think the cosmic Finnegan's are much more peripheral to Finnegan's Wake than the central model, which I believe Finnegan is Percy French. So the main character has several pseudonyms in Finnegan's Wake. So um, there's uh, he's several pseudonyms, um, and the same happens in the Jarvie. French had a load of pseudonyms because he was doing it 70% himself as time went on in particular. So um, example, Finnegan. There's Finn and Finn McCool in, in history. So Finnegan has a historical uh, counterpart, Finn McCool, and in, in myth, and um, there's a counterpart in the Bible like Adam, because it's about a great fall, and all the myth and history of the legend. Um, and then there's McGrath, which I identify connected to Percy French in Finnegan's Wake as McCready, who wrote the Jarvie, or who set up the Jarvie. But then there's a McGrath um, from history connected with the Rock of Cashel, and he was a bishop, and he was actually a Catholic bishop in the south and a Protestant bishop in the north centuries ago. So he was quite um, a reprobate. So um, French offers interchanged with, um, yeah, Swin in Finnegan's Wake, French seems to often be counterparted with Swift and Oscar Wilde. And that's kind of not unusual because they were all Anglo-Irish, um, all Protestant, uh, parodists, and um, used com comedy as a genre. And Oscar Wilde, of course, was born the same year as Percy French. And all had, because there's a great fall in Finnegan's Wake. Somebody has a great fall. And then, the per you know, this person keeps getting up again and going on. Um, so Joyce had all the hu all the human endeavour. Um, yeah, he saw it all as celebrated in Christian minstrelry, especially the ballad. So the basic story about a man's fall, yeah. So the fall, you see, it's, it's very comic, Finnegan's Wake. So therefore, the, the ballad Finnegan, uh, the, um, um, Finnegan's Wake, which is the fellow uh, being being dead, and the the bottle of whiskey or the barrel of whiskey is over him and he wakes, comes back to life again. So it's comical, and Finnegan's Wake is meant to be a great human com comedy. So but all the falls are parallel then to the fall in Eden, and that's the more cosmic side of it, because it's all about Adam and Eve as well, and the fall in Eden, and because, because Joyce wanted to make it so cosmic, he had to have this kind of um, very dramatic uh, aspect to it, which goes well beyond Percy French. Um, but the impulse, uh, the human impulse is to rise again, and I think if anybody narrated as the comedy, okay, often via minstrel shows, a lot of men, so okay. So one of uh, the, the Humpty Dumpty is one of the, um, is one of the names for the, the hero in Finnegan's Wake, Humpty Dumpty, because Humpty Dumpty has a great fall. And of course, Percy French used the 
the, the, um, the nursery rhymes and Humpty Dumpty in a lot of his shows. Loads of the nursery rhymes. People forget they were actually in his shows, but they were. You'd see it from his playbills. So if we look at this side, we have Humpty Dumpty, Finnegan, Phil, because he's Phil Finnegan, and from Phil the Futures Ball, Finn, and then John Joyce. So John Joyce um, had a very strange experience in distilleries. We don't know if French was one of his victims, but French lost all his money in the distillery. Um, the Jarvie um, came down. This is French's own situation. Then he had, six months after the Jarvie, the death of his first wife, Ethel, Etty, as he was known as. And then a year after that, less than a year, 10 months after that, Strongbow failed because the Nationalist Press took umbrage. And it was doing very well in the first week and it had to be taken off. And this is all in Finnegan's wake. And then, of course, further on, you had World War I, which did a mortal blow to poor old French's entertainments because there was no entertainment in London. Nobody was, nobody was putting on shows because the, of the war. And then 1916. 1916 finished Percy French, really, because he showed that he had in Dublin in 1916 was playing in Eastburn. And um, there was very little about, about Dublin in it. Um, it's called How Dublin Does It, but it was about Hamlet, the ghost of Hamlet, um, something about a silhouette, and Etty, his daughter, was in it. But anyway, because 1916 happened, it was immediately pulled off the stage. And Etty said, her daughter said years later, the name killed it. There was no, um, there was no taste in London or in England for any kind of Irish entertainment, no matter how frivolous or you know, non-political. So French's, um, French's uh, livelihood was dealt a mortal blow a number of times. So he had lots of falls, but the thing about Percy French was he pulled himself up again. I mean, I don't believe anybody overcame as much adversity as Percy French. By comparison, John Joyce, James Joyce's father, um, who was a contemporary of Percy French and certainly knew, they, they would have known him, but Collison knew him anyway very well. I'm not know, I don't know how well he might have known Percy. But um, he had a great fall, as we know. In the end, lost all his money and was sacked from his job in the rates office and began the slide in 1892 into, into their um, terrible situation for the family. But he didn't, he didn't rise again in the way the Percy French did. So then over here, we have the more cosmic thing, like we have Adam, Oscar Wilde, and he had a great fall as well. We all know about that. Fun McCool and Parnell, of course. So Parnell... So, of course, Adam would be the fall in Eden, which is all the cosmic thing. Then Kishi O'Shea from Parnell, the divorce. Wilde's trial and his death very young. We just split in the Irish Parliamentary Party into the Parnellites and Anti-Parnellites. And then the quick lime incident in Kilkenny and the early death of Parnell in October 1891. So the, all these people have great falls, really. Um, so the common themes in Finnegan's Wake that you find also in Percy French are the use of brogue. Uh, and there's a lot of brogue in the Jarvey because the Jarvey driver was, you know, a man who would speak in the local idiom. So quite a bit, but of course, not, not a huge percentage of it, but there is a lot of brogue in it in places when the Jarvey is speaking. And then nursery rhymes. The nursery rhymes are all over Finnegan's Wake. And of course, Percy French was the master of nursery rhymes, writ rewritten in parody form um, as, the, as the classical poets would have written. Uh, then you had Moore's Melodies. Well, Moore's Melodies, of the 122 of them, there's lines from uh, 120 of them in Finnegan's Wake. Moore's Irish Melodies. And it's a forgotten today that Percy French parodied loads of Moore's Melodies. They're in the Jarvey and they're in the, um, they're in the Irish Cyclist. So I have some of them in the book that I, that I produced. So um, this is very telling because at one stage in Finnegan's Wake, he names the hero as the trumpeter, which is the troubadour, who mangles Moore's melodies. And all the, all the Joyceans believe that he's talking about Joyce himself. But French was the troubadour, so the troubadour who mangled Moore's melodies was Percy French, another clue, but missed, the Joyceans missed it. So then the Shan Van Vogt. You know, the Shan Van Vogt, we all know, she was a poor old woman, and this was all going on around the time of the Celtic revival, that Ireland was this poor woman vanquished and defeated. And French took that up himself and kind of made fun of it presented himself as a Shan Van Vogt. And then the pseudonyms, all the pseudonyms in the Jarvey, the main people in Finnegan's Wake have numerous pseudonyms and they're all for the same person. And then uh, the getting up and going on despite adversity. That's the essential of Finnegan's Wake and certainly that's true of Percy French. And then Napoleon lectures. It opens with a lecture on Napoleon uh, in Phoenix Park, Finnegan's Wake does. And French had a lecture on Napoleon and French's sister, 
gave lectures um, on French after she produced her book in 1922. So I think that's kind of in Finnegan's wake as well, just um, giving an exhibition in Phoenix Park and all about Napoleon. I think that's actually about Percy French and about his sister giving those lectures. Um, Strongbow Cromwell, French called him Cromwell in, fin in, in, in the Jarby. He had a serialized story and a serialized story on Strongbow and then Noah's Ark. They're all in Finnegan's wake. So while friends called Cromwell Cromwell, Joyce called him Crumb, Crumbwell with the B. Um, okay, so the Shan van Vogt, French presents himself in 1902 as the old woman, poor old woman. It's very funny. Uh, just when all the revivalists were taking it all very seriously, he said he was the Shan van Vogt, um, and he was one of the stranded gentry, and he was presenting himself. Um, it's a very, very good song, very funny song, and not at all offensive. And he came back to Dublin, he was under royal patronage, and that was a big, there was a lot of publicity. So Joyce must have got his hands on that, because it comes up straight away in the early, the first two chapters of Finnegan's Wake are introductory. So the wake takes off in chapter three. Chapter three opens with Chess She, which is French's says she formula. That's a version of it. Because Joyce um, corrupts everything in language. And then Bigamy Bob and his old Shan booked. So Bob was probably Robert Broadbent, another pseudonym for, Finnegan's, uh, for Finnegan. Um, and F Broadbent had the pub in Chapel Lizard where Finnegan's Wake is set, um, the Mullingar Inn. So chit chatters. Now this is Etty's column, per Percy's first wife, Etel, Etty. And she had this column, first of all, it was called Fan Lights. And then nearer to the time she was about to get married to Percy, it was called Chit Chatters. And this is a photograph of her. So she, she drew herself into the, into the sea of the Chit Chatters. And it's subtitled, From a Magpie to a Pelican in the Windowless. It was a letter to a London cousin. And Finnegan's Wake is all about chat and this um, uh, wash of women chatting on the side of the Liffey. Uh, very much, I think, um, drawn from her Chit Chatters column. Because he mentions it in several parts of Finnegan's Wake. Uh, she's only chit house chats in us banking bee bonnetry. She seemed to love fashion, and she wrote an awful lot about fashion in the chit chatters column. Um, so um, she, uh, French had the name Daphne for her, which few people know about. And there's, um, as I said, Finnegan's Wake, the, everybody has spawns different versions, and because it's written as a dream narrative, different uh, identities come together. But I think this here must be some way to her, this one here, Isabel, in her, she's one, of, she's one of the daughters, in is so pretty, true to tell, wild wood's eyes and primrose hair, quietly, all the woods so wild, in mauves of moss, and Daphne Jews. Now, that was where Joyce often used women's names as a kind of an adjective, or as a descriptive noun. How all so still she lay, deeply now, even calm, lay sleeping. I just don't want to go over time. How am I? Uh, okay. So... Um, the Chit Chatters columns is, he mentions Chit Chat Chats, often on chat bags, and um, an awful lot about her columns come up in the wake in terms of the fashion and all the rest of it. So, yeah, her name is corrupted often on parts of Finnegan's Wake. She's only Chit Chats in her spanking bee bonnetry, okay, and that's where he's actually speaking about the, the Jarvie as a writing academy in Blamange and maple syrup. So, yeah, then he describes, I think it must be Etty, the daughter, as her gown was a very dressy affair known as an Ethel. So, as I said, this is how Joyce used language. He used the word, the name Ethel, as a kind of a description for clothes. Uh, and then the corruptions of Ethel's name in uh, very far on in the wake, Eitel, Ethel, Zethel, that's... Um, to me, that's exactly how he used language. It's the basic family in Finnegan's Wake. There's a f um, HCE, he was a publican, his wife, Anne Olivia Plurabel, and then he had three children, twin sons and a daughter, Isabel. Of course, that's not faithful to French. French didn't run a pub. So as I said, 70%, and there's a lot of poetic license taken. But um, um, there are still three children. Of course, French did run a shop for a while in Dublin after the Jarvie folded him. Um, mainly to sell his paintings with Etty. So, um, I'm sorry, did I go past something there? Uh, sorry, sorry, okay. Um, so the Jarby, as I said, French had new, numerous pseudonyms in the Jarby. Poet Flanagan, Yehu, which is the one that really made me think, Will Wagtail, Office Liar, Malarkey, Balladmonger, Strolling Homer, 
O'Hara's half brother. And here's the one, Fungus Bloom. And Fungus Bloom is all about, all about um, plants and flowers. And funnily enough, Leopold Bloom in Finnegan's Wake seems to love plants and flowers. And um, writes a lot of, talks a lot about plants and flowers. So I wonder if he's inspired to some extent by that column, which was for a few months in the Jarvey. And of course, the Mountain Jew. And then there was Macaulay. These are the, the classical poets, Tennyson, Browning as Frowning, Byron and all the rest of it. So um, at this mirrors, this is mirrored in Finnegan's Wake. The same people have a number of pseudonyms like does Hosty, Perso Wiley, the Cad and um, Jehu are the, the tormentors of Finnegan. And they're all more or less the same person or composites of each other. So it's very much structured like the Jarvey, Finnegan's Wake. So then this one, this is the one of the pages, full pages from, Eshi, um, um, from uh, Emily de Bourgh Daly's book, which came out in 1922, which I'm in absolutely no doubt James Joyce had and disposed of the evidence um, after Phil engagements in the morning. It's when they were leaving the Savage Club, um, Collison and himself. Um, and this, I found, it, I found it once in Finnegan's Wake, but since I've written the book, I found it two more times. So he definitely had the chronicles of Percy French. Um, I, can, I can tell that from just how the amount of knowledge he had of his stuff. Why he concealed it, I don't know, um, that he's used to Percy French. Um, he said when he left Dublin that he would use the arms of silence, exile, and cunning. This is Joyce. He certainly lived up to that. And there seems to have been a lot of bad blood between Joyce's father and Percy French and Collison. Probably a lot of jealousy. Um, so um, this is a giveaway one, because as I said, I found it twice since uh, the afterfield engagements in the morning. Uh, it's very hard to deal with such a big topic and reduce it down. So French's death in Liverpool, I was looking around and I was trying, I was reading more about Finnegan's Wake than I wanted to read Wake. I knew there was, I had a lot of it, but I, I knew there was more, there was some clencher. So when I couldn't find anything, I started to read the Wake, especially chapter three where it actually begins. And if you know Percy French as well as I've come to know him, um, you pick up things that other people wouldn't pick up. So then at the end, at the very end, on, on page 74, I found the reference to the death in Liverpool. Because Finnegan's Wake is about this giant of Dublin. It's Hoth, his head is in Hoth and his legs, this is part of it as well, his legs are in um, the Phoenix Park. So this is the corruption of the language, but his bandolier over his shoulder. Now here's a second one I found. Wishing the loft to Philadelphia in the morning. Well, that's off to Philadelphia in the morning. That's, that's the first reference to the chronicles of Percy French, um, the, the poster that I showed you. So he made leave by many a door um, that are uphill and down Coombe, at Hoth or at Kulak or even at Enniskerry. Well, this is kind of French going around, um, going around the various places entertaining, which he did in all the small little places. At theory, none too rectiline for the evolution of human society and a testament of the rocks for all their dead unto some of the living and they shall be gathered unto him in the lightning lancer, some fin, some fin avant. So avant, I think, is a before in French. He shall wake from earth sleep, hot crested Elmer. Rise, O lost leader, live, the heroes return. His mighty horn, Skullroke, Ireland, roll. So a lot of people, of, um, a lot of joy scenes see that as a reference to Parnell, but there are parallels between French and Parnell. It's like the jar, Parnell had a, you know, had a terrible fall, died in the end. Uh, after the divorce and the split in the party. And the Jarvey came down because of Parnell, you know, because there was a considerable amount of lampooning of Parnell and Jarvey. So I would see that as because Joyce always wanted to have more than one reference. So there's reference to Percy French and Parnell, but there's a call then to wake from the earth sleep. And it ends with Percy French because it's Amidamelo, um, men crenadistus mortem, and that is the devil you think I'm dead, which is a line from Finnegan's Wake, the song. You know, if you know the song Finnegan's Wake, the actual song, the devil you think I'm dead. So this is French obviously answering back. And it means really that he's famous after he dies. Um, so after a call to him, he answers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and then it goes, silence is in the festive halls where the green woods went dry. Oh, sorry. Oh, Triga, where 
thy green woods went dry, but there would be sounds of many mirth on the night's ear ringing when our patriarch gets to pull over on his boots. Now, this is the way Joyce writes. So silence in our festival halls is a very beautiful Moore's melody, which Moore wrote as a tribute, as a lament for his friend John Richardson, um, John Stevenson, who set a lot of his poems or his to, to old Irish airs. And the old Irish air that was set to was The Green Woods of Truriga, which is absolutely beautiful air. And it's a beautiful poem. I have two chapters of it, uh, two verses of it in my book. So the priest in his boots then, Sounds of Many Mirth, is a more light-hearted Moore's melody. And it's a, it's a, a joyous one. And the set to the priest in his boots, and of course that would be a reference to Collison because... That's the way Joyce wrote in Finnegan's Wake. Everything is encrypted. It's all puzzles. So the priest in his boots in Old Irish Air, and uh, Collison died a week after French. So then Liverpool, he calls it Liverpool because he had read the Chronicles and he knew Joyce, or that French was poor when he died, which I'd say shocked Joyce. But we all know now that French was owed a fortune in royalties when he died. And he says, not a bit of it, which means not a bit of it. In other words, he's not dead. And then he goes, Finglas, Pembroke, I can't make out the Chilbel aimed, whatever that is, Baldoyle, Baldoyle, Bal, Bal, it should be Bal, not Baldoyle, yeah, Baldoyle in Dublin, yeah. And then, of course, a little kind of a pinch in it, Hump is in his doge. Hump, meaning Humpty Dumpty, another, another name he had for the, the hero. And words weigh no more to him than raindrops. Well, that is the acknowledgement that Percy French was way down with words. And certainly, if you knew all of Percy French's work, he was an incredible wordsmith. He, the amount of work he did was in, just even in the Jarvie alone, given that he did several, like beautiful poems and parodies and limericks and nursery rhymes. It's absolutely fantastic. Statues in Dublin talking to each other across the Liffey. Absolutely, really imaginative. Then all the stories, the serialised stories in the Jarvie. That's the Jarvie alone. And of course, if you look at his playbills, people just remember him today for the ballads. The playbills are very, shows how very sophisticated his repertoire was. Um, but I tried to incorporate them into appendices in the book so that people realise just how diverse Percy French was. And he crossed John's, as Joyce does. Like he went from the ballad, and then he grabs the ballads, French did onto nursery rhymes, onto bits of opera, especially Gilbert and Sullivan. And all of this is kind of replicated in Finnegan's Wake. So, so some summary line to jump out from Finnegan's Wake that you know immediately, if you know Percy French, reference to Percy French, or the chess she thing, which it says she, which is the formula he used a lot, is if people who know him know he used that per she. And bigamy Bob and his old Shanvocht, well that was a reference to the Shanvanvocht, the trumpeter, I said some of this before, who mangled Moore's melodies. Oh yeah, all over Finnegan's Wake he goes on about his word pictures, his word pictures and his pencil on his ear. Because French, you know, the, the chalk sketches upside down uh, when he got rid of the lantern lecture and he started doing these upside down chalk sketches and illustrating what he was his, his shows with chalk. Uh, very, very clever. Um, he might be a volunteer Vouston. Well, we all know Val, Val Vouston or volunteer Vouston wrote the Irish jaunting car, a famous uh, ballad. From the t for the time to celebrate C Queen Victoria's arrival in Dublin or in, in Killarney sometime in the 1850s, I think. And he wrote the Irish jaunting car because she took a trip on a jaunting car in Killarney. Queen Victoria wouldn't be able to do it today. But anyway, without all that, we know um, there would probably be um, a security risk. So French in the Night of the Road opera had his own version of the Irish jaunting car. So that's why he says he might be a volunteer boost. And this is another clue he's talking about Percy French. Because Joyce was very um, impressed with the Night of the Road Opera. Bits of it are in Finnegan's Wake as well. But he mentions it by name in Ulysses. Um, it was a very, very um, good opera. I mean, it was Gilbert and Sullivan. Some lovely, lovely songs in it. Forgotten today. It'd be lovely if it was put on again. But anyway, um, then the hobo who possessed a large amount of the humoresque. Well, the hobo, who possessed a large amount of humor has to be Percy French. His lights are not out ye all, all out yet, the Liverpooser. Well, that's another pun on Liverpool. And he's more or less saying French, because French was very famous for a long time after he died. So he's, he's not, lights are not out. And then there's um, all these duos. I meant to say that earlier. Parallel with the central character, there's all these duos. Treacle Tom, Frisky Shorty, Brown and Nolan, Mush and Jeff. And they all, you can trace French and Collison in those. And there was one Glug and Chuff, 
So he says, love the poor one in limbo pool, which is another corruption of Liverpool. So this is again a reference to French dying in poverty in Liverpool. So he conceals under various names. This is another one. He says, it's it. but he's always Percy Riley. So he's referring there to all the pseudonyms French had in the Jarvey. Um, the total of your flouts is not fit to Fanny's fettle is um, one of the many corruptions of the lines from Phil de Flutus Ball. And I think that was probably uh, John Joyce thinking he was better than everybody else because he considered himself to be the lost Campanini in Dublin, but he had no discipline when it came to his music, uh, his father, John Joyce. So Visite, oh yeah, come back, Pat, Baddy Wiley to Bally James Duff, you know what that is. Um, um, Visite, John Carla Herlebel is one of four lines of uh, corruptions of French's song, John Carla Her. And um, cycling back to more mount mountains after French rev evolution is French coming back after his first wife died when he cycled, went on a cycling tour on his own. And there was rumours that, that that was when the rumour started that French had committed suicide because he lost touch with people for a while. And that's in a twice about the cycling back. So, well spat, witty wagtail. Well spat, witty wagtail. That's obviously a reference to Percy French's um, Will Wagtail um, pseudonym. Uh, he'll, hand, he'll soon hand tune, he'll hand tune your Aaron's ears for you. So, um, Nine hosts in himself in his hydroeconomic establishment. Percy French often presented as nine or ten different people in one show. It was amazing. I read a review of one of his shows in Wet Minds in a book, and I couldn't believe it. He was the ace of spades. He was the hard queen of hearts. He was um, a, a dealer. He was all sorts of different things, all very quickly. Um, and then um, to mock their quarrels and Dolly Man tumbling. I don't know why I put that there, but I think that's kind of um, an acknowledgement that him, John Joyce and French and Collison were not exactly what you'd call good friends. Uh, so here, some pages from the Jarvey showing Etty's drawings. Um, Etty had beautiful illustrations. So the Jarvey was mainly illustrated by Richard Caulfield Orpen, who was the older brother of Sir William Orpen, the great painter, famously. But Etty did some lovely drawings, and before she married French, she never signed them. But after she married him, she put them E-K-F, Ethel Catley in French. So this is a lovely one, um, I think the one in the orchard, it's in the book, never been republished before, and it's the three stages of life really, about children in the, in the orchard, and then you have the, the lovers in the orchard, and it goes about cupids are hanging on every bough, and you can see there, she puts cupids on the boughs, and she tries to net one with a net, it's beautiful, and, and then of course the end of life, is, it's a lovely poem by Percy French. And there's a number of these uh, poems that Percy wrote when she, and when she uh, married him. Huge full-page illustrations. They're absolutely magnificent. And then the other one is um, when Gilbert and Sullivan's opera, The Gondoliers, was in Dublin. She illustrated that. And at the top, you have um, traditional gondola. And at the bottom, you have um, set in the island of Rottersby in, so in Scotland. Um, you have the, um, the, the, the drunken men in the kilts and the Tissel of Scotland. And you, I can't really read them there, but you, they're very nice um, pieces. And of course here, am I nearly, am I going over time? Yeah, I better finish off quickly. So the Balladeer, Perse O'Reilly Hostie. Now, this is a drawing from the Jarvey. And in the Jarvey, as I said, there's one page where, or a couple of pages where he's all the statues in Dublin complaining and meeting together. French has, and he, he gives them banjos, and they start have, they, fight, they eventually have um, a smoking concert, and they have a minstrel show. So I believe this, well this I know the, who they are, this is King Billy, he's off his statue. That's Daniel O'Connell, and I think that must be Goldsmith or maybe Edmund Burke. Here is Wellington, and this is um, Nelson, and you can see the banjos. So French as I said, had them all eventually doing a minstrel show. And it's a very good piece. I haven't, I've only a bit of it in the book. But he goes, um, he explains about the balladeer in, it, uh, um, in this part of Finnegan's Wake, and it has to refer to this bit of the Jarvey and to Percy French, who was Percy Riley and Hostie. He need O'Connell up out of his dos, that shouldered Burke that booked O'Hara. Now, O'Hara was one of the main characters in the Night of the Road Opera, which really impressed Joyce. Um, that woke the busker, that grattened the crowd. That's the way he used language, grattened the crowd. Um, grattened his crowd. That booked the jiggers to rhyme the ran, that flooded the route of Aaron's Isle, 
from Main, Mel and Chatelier, and Karen Sorpoint to Selena Galwa, um, that brought the ballad that Hostie made. So I think that's a massive tribute to Percy French. It has to be Percy French. And I'm sure inspired by the statues here, you know, with them getting, getting them up. Because it's very, which is the kind of thing Joyce would love, of course. So then French was referred to by name twice in Finnegan's Wake. And he was named as the writer of annoying most letters and scurrilous ballads, McGrath's tug, smelling cheaply of Paris spirits like a deep sea dibbler and he's not fit to throw guts down to a bear. It sounds very pejorative, but I think Finnegan's Wake is letting out an awful lot of, in the, through the dream narrative, what Joyce was containing. And this, they were exactly the kind of, kind of stuff that the father would be saying. Like he dismissed the, the primate of all Ireland at the time of Parnell as the chub of guts up in Armagh. So guts was a kind of a term of abuse for John Joyce. But um, when I've looked at that again, and I read a blog about shovelands, this shovelands, shovel bands, why well, should have annoying those letters? Um, it was a really good blog I read after I wrote the, wrote the book, and it said that that was a reference to the Bantry Gang against Parnell. So there were a lot of letters in the Jarvey. There was a few letters, and there was a Hickenbottom letter bag. Now, I'm convinced Percy French did not write the letters. They were written by MacReady, because MacReady set up the Jarvey, so he had a reason, and he contributed to journals all over the world. So why wouldn't he contribute to Jarvey, which was an Irish punch and a very peculiar thing to do at such a high point in, in Irish nationalism? So he had obviously um, a, mo a motive, and he put, Joy he put French in as the editor because French had all the connections. Um, MacReady was a, a clergyman's son, you know, French was a landlord's son, it was a big difference. However stranded, he still was gentry. And French was very conscious of that. So the Bantry gang against Parnell mixed in here with MacReady, and that's what Joyce did. He mixed people in because it was dream. So I'm now thinking, you see, he says in Percy French. So I think that's, to me, that he's saying there that he was writing in one of Percy French's pseudonyms and pretending to be Percy French. So um, then th there's another one. It's kind of harmless enough. Uh, children doing the homework and there's a reference to Percy French. It's early on in chapter two. So then Moore's Melodies as code breakers in Finnegan's Wake. Well, I think you can generally say wherever you have Moore's Melody, okay. Wherever you have Moore's Melody, there's, um, there's, there's, you can connect to Finnegan's, or to, sorry, to, to Percy French. And the same with nursery rhymes. It's kind of a broad statement, but it's generally true. Um, uh, just as Eurbeck's identity is being unveiled, his wife, Anna Olivia Plurabel, um, anoints him with Moore's melodies. Now, it's all very funny, Finnegan's Wake. Uh, from the first... Uh, OK, but that's kind of what I've said before. So, OK, there's an example of uh, the redemptive part of Finnegan's Wake which is the last chapter, which is really a resurrection. And it's very moving in places. And the life of the wandering bard. And if you read it, I haven't time to read it now, but again, if you read that, that poem by Thomas Moore, it actually sums up Percy French. So while he can be very scurrilous by Percy French in parts of Finnegan's Wake, if you spend 17 years waiting, what I believe is 70% one man's obituary, it has to be flattery. And there was green eye there. So just to end now, I've, since I wrote the book, I got the absolute clencher, which I believe really clenches as well as the reference to the death in Liverpool, which nobody picked up in 80 plus years since James Joyce died, or sorry, since Finnegan's Wake was published. So here we have, and I have two things underlined, the very last lines, when you say the last line is the last line of the last page, because it goes back to the beginning again. So I've, this is a portmanteau word, buzz off to the, can anybody work it out? Some people know it, don't say it. If you take it apart, it's three words. Buzz, which is, then lips. So buzz is a Victorian word for kiss. So in the 22nd, of, I was looking at that after I published the book and I went back to the end of Finnegan's Way because I didn't look at the end of it because as I said to Kevin, one of us has to go me or this book. <laughs> But anyway, that was bugging me, that word, and I thought it was the, the Lee, maybe, the River Lee. And then I read a blog and I said, it's a kiss of somebody. So if you don't scramble it, it's buzz of Ethel. The last word is Ethel. It's scrambled, but that's the way he wrote Finnegan's Wake. So it's the kiss of Ethel. So the very end of Finnegan's Wake is about French and, and the Anna Olivia Plurabel monologue. 
Now, there are polyphonic voices in it, but all the Joycens believe it's one woman in particular. So here you have Finn again take Buzz off to Lee, Memember Me till Thousand Ends, till Thousand Ends D, Lips. Then he says the keys to given, which means he's given the keys to Finnegan's Wake. And I think they're the two keys, the kiss and the buzz of Ethel. Away alone, alas, to love the long, the river will run, and it's back to the beginning. So just to tie it in, finally, with this um, thing. I believe there's two envoy. He would have read that by Percy French and Paradise, which is Ethel. Um, he's, it's about Etty. And Joyce wrote this in Paris in 1939. So he had the Chronicles of Percy French, which he would have read the envoy, which is about the seabird and the thing, you know, the gulls. Because a lot of people think that's about, that's Tennyson's crossing the bar there, but it isn't. And then the paradise. So as I said, when Joyce was writing that in Paris in 1939, he was looking back on his own childhood and just before his family went into, you know, that terrible decline that happened when his father lost a job in 1892, the job he folded in January 1891. Paris, he was about to leave Paris because of the Nazis. So to me, he looked back on that time in Dublin with immense nostalgia. And sadness. So to tie it in, I have a last slide, where has it gone? So to tie it in, I suppose with, it's gone the last night, to tie it in with the theme of this, which is, has a soul a future. Well, I think if, if these two poems can inspire this kind of writing, 